Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to today's episode of PhotoBiz Live. This is Danny from the PhotoBiz team, and today we're going to be joined by Brett Tyler for a webinar on how to handle simple wedding photography. So Brett is going to be showing you just how the basics of how he handles wedding photography and how keeping it simple can really lead to awesome positive wedding photography. And um, I've had a great chance to know Brett for a little over three years now. He's been uh, with PhotoBiz for a very long time, very dedicated customer to us, and obviously amazing photographer as well, and all around awesome guy, and I'm really excited that he's finally getting to do a webinar with us. He's also uh, an educator as well in the photography world. So, Brett, I wanted to uh, give you the chance to give yourself just a little introduction as well, and then what we'll do whenever you're done with that, we'll go ahead and uh, jump right into things. So how are you doing today, Brett? Hey, Danny, I'm good. Thanks. Thanks for having me here. Awesome. I'm glad that you're able to join us. And again, I'm glad that everyone else is uh, able to join us at this time today. I know we know that a 2 p.m. is a little bit odd for you guys, especially in different time zones, but you're going to get a lot of valuable information out of today's webinar. So just before we get started, I wanted to give you guys just a quick rundown. Um, if at any point during today's webinar you're having any kind of difficulty hearing Brett or myself, just use the chat tool and, we'll, and I'll try and do my best to troubleshoot for you. Also, um, we like to have this discussion on Twitter, so if you have any kind of questions or you want to tweet what's going on in the webinar, you can use the hashtag PhotoBizLive. And and um, with that being said, I'm going to go ahead and turn things over to Brett and let him jump right into it. Thanks, Danny. Well, thanks, everybody, for attending today's webinar. And I'm really excited to, uh, once again, be part of PhotoBiz and share my knowledge with everybody. Um, it's a great community out there. And uh, I believe we're all in it for, this, for the same reason, which is to have a great time, fulfill our dreams, and uh, get paid. <laughs> <laughs> so... With that, I'd like to tell you a little bit about myself. I like to keep it simple. I love natural light. Um, I think that you know, off-camera lighting and additional lighting is good when you need it, but most of the time you can find that if you just keep it simple with your lighting, um, you're focusing more on capturing the moments, which is really what the clients are after and what they need. So with that, I'd like to get started on our course today. Um, I've been doing this for 25 years, and uh, I, I really do, I find that you know, just capturing the moments with natural light will really free you up and allow you to be simple and productive. So let's take it. Dress up. You know, dress up when you meet your clients. Dress up for the occasion. Dress up for yourself. When you feel sharp, when you look sharp, <laughs> you feel sharp. And um, and your clients kind of come, come away with having a great confidence in knowing that's how you will look on their special day. So let's get right to it. Um, it's really all about client selection. You want to select the client that's right for you. You want the simple client as opposed to the difficult client. <laughs> because if you keep it simple, you get simple clients, and that's what it's all about. If you put your prices on your website, you'll find that you probably end up not having an opportunity to meet a client because they may go through, see that your price may be a little bit too high or even a little bit too low and disqualify you based on a number which is something that none of us really want to equivalent. When they do make contact with you, if it's via email, you really want to have them make contact with you um, in a visual way, whether it be coming to your studio or even offer a virtual meeting with you know FaceTime, Uvu, or Skype, or so many ways that you could kind of, you know, lessen everybody's time. Let's face it, when they're when they're at this point of engagement and getting married, they're planning several different meetings. They're, they're scheduling to meet with florists. They're scheduling their venue. So really what you want to do is get a chance to see them and meet them. And if you have to, even have them email you a photo so you, got, you have a chance to see, basically, if it's what you're looking for. And you want to be dramatically different in every way. So this way, you shoot what you see as beautiful and you'll draw clients that have the same vision. So have a vision and this particular client in this photo, they wanted to do a first look. I like to do most of my photography after the ceremony and I'll tell you why coming up. But this particular client, due to wedding day stress and timeline and all these things, they needed to do a first glance. So we found a great spot to do it and I'm familiar with this venue. It's the Rick Carlton in Palm Beach. And it's just the moment leading up to that. I, upon our meeting that we initially had, I decided that this would be the best spot due to a multitude of factors. You know, traffic in the hotel being one of them. Nobody goes to this corner. 
beautiful light coming in through the bay window there, and uh, just the ability for us to share a moment, the three of us alone. So this is one of the images that I came up with, and it's one of my all-time favorite. Impact. You want your images to have impact. You want to be impactful. So there should be mood, tone, lighting, um, and it would be reflected, again, lighting. For me, black and white really does it. It, it really has an emotional uh, side to the whole dramatic feel of a photograph. So let's go to the next slide. Be creative. You know, we photograph the dress, of course. We photograph the shoes, all those things. Bride getting her makeup on. You know, sometimes you find there's not a place to hang the dress, so you have to get creative. And um, why not include the maid of honor? <laughs> if you need help, get help. Have somebody you know, hold the curtains back for you. I feel very strongly about window light, as we can all tell at this point. So the other thing you want to include is show the romance. Definitely, you know, be ready for the moments because when they kiss, when it's a natural moment, really, it shows so much more about how they really care for each other as opposed to a staged moment of kissing. Um, so just, you know, follow them around. Tell them to go for a walk and follow around closely behind them and catch the moments. There's going to be a lot of moments. So we'll go to the next slide. And here's a moment happened right in front of the church after they were married and came out. Everybody's blowing bubbles. And uh, a magnificent kiss and a dip. <laughs> so it was perfectly done by Michael. And so you can see moments. You really just have to capture them. And you don't have time to set up lights for all this and worry about whether the light's going to fire. So if you're set up to the right shutter speed, shooting manual and uh, be careful when you're in aperture priority. Um, I'll go over those things with us coming up. Um, just grab the moments. They're beautiful. And be different. Something different. You know, most brides will tell you what they want and if you're really listening, you'll be able to hear what they want and know what they would expect. And the groom will tell you this too. I think it's really important to listen to the groom because Believe it or not, he's going to have a very large impact on wh whether he wants to spend his wedding day with you or not. They don't want to hang out with somebody who's going to be boring <laughs> or non-entertaining. Um, so we'll go to the next slide. This is really important. Coordinate. Include wedding day coordination. Include this in your package because it's good for your clients. You'll do a location scout so you'll know when the lighting and the time of day are perfect. So when you do your location scouting, do it lighting time specific. Meet with your client at their venue at that time of day. So if, if they're getting married at 5 o'clock just before sundown, you want to be there with them around that time so you can share them, share with them the light and plan around the light so you know when the light will be beautiful. You're, all day long you're going to be chasing the light and that's a beautiful thing. You want to create a timeline that allows you to be creative so you need to plan around that light and you'll work backwards from the ceremony start time really to help your client coordinate their day. Say for instance if your client is getting married on the beach at the Ritz Carlton you'll want to meet with them there and if it's all in one place that affords you the opportunity to s start only say two hours prior to that to do all of your getting ready photos of the bride, maybe a couple of the groom, and um, and get down to the wedding ceremony site and be ready for the wedding to happen. And keep it simple, guys, really. The more simple you keep it, the easier it is. It doesn't need to be difficult. So let's go to the next slide. Go to the light. So you notice that the bride is actually perfectly placed in the light, and um, it's backlighting her. So she's got rim light. The light is hitting my lens. I got lens flare. Um, the light's hitting the groom. It's also hitting the two little ring bearers in the background there to the right. And um, it's just a great moment. You know, he decided to help out and move the veil. And um, just just a grab shot, but it was a perfect moment. And um, I did place her in the light so you can see her shadow coming forward. That's about a 4 o'clock sh um, shadow. And with that time of day, the light is cool. It's, it's not so hot. And you get the nice, long dramatic shadows. So it's a great time of day to shoot. And I'm going to tell you that these photographs are post-ceremony. So they do appear very relaxed. <laughs> Let's go to the next slide. And we're really going to get into this here. 
Pose family photos. If you coordinate with your client to do these photos after the ceremony and convince them that they shouldn't you know, need to get ready early and be ready for the photographer, it, it creates a lot of drama. Grandmother's always late and you know, it's just you know, getting ready twice really for everybody, including yourself. So if you do those photos at, let's say, at the church after the wedding, everybody's already there in one place. So couples much more relaxed because they've already been married. They got their butterflies out. They've kissed. They got to walk down the aisle. And it just makes your life that much more simple. Um, you want to keep it to 30 minutes or less and use that as a selling point. Tell them, look, I won't keep you for a long time at the church taking pictures. In fact, you can tell them 15 minutes because most churches won't allow you more time than that, to be frank. Use simple lighting that won't fail. Again, you know, you don't need a light on an umbrella or additional lighting in a church. And in fact, many churches won't allow that. You know, you need to keep it simple. So there's there's a couple different devices that work very well for that. And one would be called the Gary Fong Lumisphere. I'll I'll touch on that at the end. Uh, some of these lighting modifiers that can help you to keep it simple. So when you're finished with the family, you want to send them off. Just mention cocktails. Tell them go to the reception. <laughs> There's cocktails there, and, and they'll be gone. And that's when you photograph the couple. They're already relaxed. Everybody's gone, and it's just you and the couple. And it's it's really low key. So you'll get the shots that you need for your portfolio, and that's really what it's all about. You're doing this for yourself, pretty much. Um, let's go to the next slide. You may find that you want to get the bridal party done first too, and it's it's just play it play it by ear, see what you think. This is actually done after the ceremony outside the church. You know, you want to pay attention to your composition. You've got beautiful columns, you know, you don't want to have trees growing out of the back of people's heads if you can help it. So, you know, try to have a good time with it. Keep them having fun. You know, if champagne is close by, then it's usually <laughs> a lot more fun for them. So try to remember that. And um, I would say the first important photograph you take after the after the wedding ceremony should be the bride and her parents with the groom. So you would do that, and then the bride's extended family, and then send them on their way. Get to the groom and his family, and then that leaves you with some time to play. If you want to use the bridal party, have a good time. If you have a big bridal party, it's fun. It provides great portfolio images such as this, and they'll last a lifetime. They'll love you for it. So I'm going to the next photo. Be ready for candid moments. Really, it grab the moments in between moments when they're not expecting it. So that's when you grab some really, you know, the wind picks up, the veil flies, and just push the button. Slow down. It's good to kind of everybody gets in such a rush to get from here to there. It's good to just kind of take control of things a little bit and slow things down. And you'll find that, you know, you'll see a different angle. You'll see a reflection or something to this nature. Um, shoot a few more frames. Always try to get just a few more and um, relax everybody when you slow them down. Everybody has a, just a little bit better time. So I'm going to discuss with you now, let's go to the next slide, my daytime gear. Um, this is basically all you need really f for the day and the evening, but always have a backup. I shoot with two Canon 5D Mark III's. 90% of the time I shoot with a 24 to 70 2.8. I use all L series glass with Canon. My wide angle is a 16 to 35 millimeter 2.8 2. Always have a 200 with you. A 70 to 200 uh, 2.8 with image stabilized is a great tool. Uh, always have that with you. And 100 millimeter macro really shows details such as jewelry, florals, when I'm doing the bride and her makeup, I, I think, you know, if you can be far away and still grab close-ups, then you, you can get some really, um, really fabulous images. So I always have available with me a speed light flash. Um, I use a 600 EX. That's the new Canon speed light, and I use two of them, but. They're usually in the bag. <laughs> I don't need them until I get, you know, to the point of family pictures at the church. And if I'm outside, 
I rarely use I rarely use flash at all as well. Then everything goes in my Boda bag, which is a bag that slings over my shoulder, holds all my lenses and a flash, and that allows me, you know, easy access to all my glass and quickly the ability to change lenses. This is what a L series lens looks like. And then let's get to it's always note it's got the red line. You'll always see the red line around in an L series glass. And my nighttime gear. These are all prime lenses. They don't zoom, so um, they're fixed focal length lenses. And they allow you to capture really amazing imagery in almost complete darkness. And um, so the 85 millimeter 1.2, 50 millimeter 1.2, all the way down to 24 are great. And at least take one. You know, you don't have to have all of those, but at least have you know one prime lens is going to afford you some magnificent portfolio images. And the fisheye, you know, I think one or two fisheye shots for the day or night is is good just set yourself apart a little bit and I use two small Sony video lights for my nighttime uh, evening it just gives a little bit of drama and a little bit of um, flair you can backlight and front light and all this equipment fits in my think tank shapeshifter bag it's a backpack holds all glass and, a, and an additional camera for use at the serum, at the reception. Okay? So, wow. You want to produce a few wow images, definitely, something different, just a different perspective. Um, it's fun, kind of sets you apart, and um, get creative with it. Definitely have fun. Reflections. Look for reflections. You know, there's always a great, you know, whether it's a mirror, floor, water, you know, I think uh, it's one of the one of the coolest ways to uh, show something artistic. Okay, so here we go. We're ready. It's time to shoot. I think the biggest philosophy is just relax and let go. Let things happen naturally. You know, remove yourself from visibility so they don't feel the weight of your presence. Just kind of get out of the scene. If it's a room full of girls getting dressed or girls, you know, getting their makeup on, if you put the 200 on and, you know, stand far away, you know, shoot through the doorway, I think you'll find the most, you know, clients tend to be themselves more and let loose more. When you get close with the camera and you start, you know, kind of directing and things like this, then you kind of, you're more obtrusive to their, you know, to their sense of, of being. So if you miss something, don't let it get you down, you know, there's a lot more coming. And don't be afraid, if, especially a ceremony, you know, if you miss something like a kiss or if you miss a ring shot or something like that, there's no reason why you can't ask them, you know, to do it, you know, set it up, pose it, and make it happen again for them if it's important. If it's important to you, that way you can really you can let off and just relax and just you'll find that everything you need will happen naturally and occur naturally throughout the day so don't don't worry about that so much and that that will make you a better photographer because you'll be relaxed that's key so let's go on to second shooters you know I like to keep it simple as often as possible I like to shoot alone and but some weddings let's face it there's huge audience and you know many different angles to shoot from so you know if you can have somebody up in the uh, bell tower then you're going to get some other great portfolio images and great images for your client this is one uh, my wife took and that's me right in the center don't be afraid during the ceremony to be right in the center um, or even in receptions, you know, don't be afraid to be there because that's really, you're going to get the best perspective, you're going to be, get the best um, composition, you know, if you're af afraid to be present, then it will, it will 
look that way when your clients look at the photos. You know, if you're not afraid to be right in the center and you know when to disappear as the bride goes by and the parents go by, you can step down and kneel down and go off to the side and as the next group of people come in and don't be afraid to get back in, in the center. You'll find nobody minds. They know you're there to capture those images and you'll get great images like this. There's no flash here. There's a videographer just down to my right and he's got a little bit of frontal um, halogen lighting going on here. So I barely ever use a flash. Angles. Get the good stuff from angles. People in motion. It's good photography. Close-ups. Make sure you get a lot of close-ups. This is one of my favorites. You always need to be to the bride's side <laughs> when you're behind the minister as the groom's putting the ring on. Otherwise, you won't. You really won't have a chance to get this shot. So that's where that's where you should be. Break the 180 degree rule. Um, and it's all about perspective. Your perspective, how you see it, your angle. Um, I love low angles. I shoot a lot. Uh, I shoot a lot of low angles, and it gives me something different. Um, and you know, my clients appreciate the perspective. So let's go on to ambience. You know, your clients are going to have this fabulous room decorated well, and oftentimes. There's a great wide shot if you can get it. Of course, you want a few detailed shots, close-ups. Um, but I think it's very important to be able to get free. And you know, cocktails. You could really these days everybody has a digital camera. They're taking if you need to if there's something that you would need to miss. I think you could miss a little bit of cocktails because everybody's photographs photographing themselves and they're eating hors d'oeuvres. So this would be the time to kind of dip away and get a beautiful room shot for them and get ready for their first dance. So let's move on to shooting tips. Always shoot raw and always shoot in manual mode. Um, if you're going to use aperture priority, I suggest not using it when you're shooting something that's backlit. And I avoid shutter priority pretty much at all costs. So, but if you want to use aperture priority, it's great to use if, if you, you know, in the middle of the daytime, beautiful light outside, uh, it's fine to use aperture priority. Just pay attention to your shutter speed. You know, you want to be around 200 of a second at least if you're outdoors and people are moving. And when to shoot multiple frame bursts. Um, you might hear one of my good friends, Joe Busink, refers to this as spray and pray. <laughs> uh, multiple frame bursts are great to shoot when the bride and groom are on their first kiss. You know, you want to make sure because if somebody blinks or, you know, or they only just give each other a peck, and you want to make sure you got as many shots of that as you can. Another great time to do that would be when the bride tosses her bouquet, you want to shoot it on multiple frames to get as many frames as you can captured. Then keep the, keep the camera to your eye and be ready. Always be ready. You never know when that moment's going to happen and you got to capture it. So there's another, don't chimp. Chimping is referred to as, <laughs> you know, when you're when you grab a great photo and you look at the back of the camera and you go, ooh, and you show your assistant, ooh, and it's ooh, ooh, ooh. So you really, you miss a lot of moments when, you, when you're looking at it. And don't delete. Never delete on a job. First, you're taking your attention away from what you're supposed to be doing, which is photographing. And there's also a chance if you, if you delete too many files, you can corrupt the card and corrupt the data on the card. So you don't want to delete on the job. Just save that for when you get back to the studio. Let's go to the next slide. So wedding clients will turn into lifelong clients. You'll have baby portraits, family portraits. They'll even come to you for their business, commercial photography, and product photography. And you can take all that work if you'd like. 
So if you take very good care of your clients, they will turn into lifelong clients and keep in touch with them. Send them anniversary cards, send them holiday cards, and just continue the love their way. And it will all come back to you tenfold. So I'd like to tell you all to have fun. Make sure you're having fun all the time. And your clients will have fun with you too. And this is a good shot of my clients at the end of their wedding day <laughs> on the way to their honeymoon. I wanted to share a few things with you as I promised I would um, on the next slide. These are some great suggestions, Kubota image tools and I have some Boda bucks to give away. I have two uh, sets of 50 Boda bucks to give to the first two participants today. Um, Jim Garner makes the Boda bag. That's the bag that slings around your waist or your shoulder to carry all of your lenses. And a uh, very influential character in my life was Gary Fong well, with his invention of the Lumisphere. That's something that can really simplify your lighting um, when you're in a pinch. So you can find that there's there's several different types of Lumisphere and they're geared specifically towards the make of flash that you shoot with. So you can when you're on that site, you can look for uh, the model that fits your flash. And then we had one more thing for you, which is today we're doing a photo biz special. Um, if you want to learn more and make yourself more effective. Since I'm so busy all the time, I don't have time to email. Uh, staff doesn't have time to send out too many emails during December. But um, this you may find helpful. Um, pricing documents, wedding contracts to get you started. And uh, very important, you know, policies on album design. You can't let your clients, you know, uh, play album designer at the end because it really, it's more productive if you do that. So, Danny? All right, awesome, Brett. Well, thank you for the great presentation. And at this time, for everyone who's uh, attending, we have quite a bit of uh, attendees right now. You guys can go ahead and submit your question. We do have a few that have already come in throughout the webinar. Um, I'm going to go ahead and IM that link to all the attendees as a hyperlink. So if you guys are interested in checking out that special that Brett has running for the week on um, his pricing documents, wedding contract, and album design uh, agreement form that will be sent to your your chat area. So, um, Brett, we're going to just jump into questions and see how many we can knock out in the allotted time. That way, uh, I know you're a very busy man, and your studio is very busy right now. So if you guys do have pending questions, go ahead and ask them now so we can ask them over to Brett. All right, so, Brett. Thanks, Ian. Um, we have a question here about gear from Kristen. She says, Hi, Kristen. Kristen says, uh, I just got a Mark III and a prime lens. If I only have the budget right now for one more lens, what would you suggest? And what's the difference in the L series and the non L series lenses? Well, first of all, she's using a full frame camera, so she needs to be using full frame lenses. Um, and I. I I'm a big proponent of Canon's glass. So I would say, if ask her what she has, which two lenses she has. All right, Kristen, if you want to just chat us over here, what lens you have right now, and what's your prime lens that you have? She has the 50 millimeter 1.4. OK. I would tell her to go ahead, especially with the Mark III, invest in the 24 to 70 II. 2.8 L series, which is the new lens, and uh, it's sharp as a tack, and she can shoot pretty much an entire wedding. I did a project where I t that was the only lens that I took for the day, and um, I shoot 90, I'll say 90 percent of everything I shoot is with the 24 to 70 2.8 L series. That's your bread and butter lens, especially for weddings. All right, awesome. So hopefully that helps you out uh, with yeah. that, Christian. And let's jump right into the next question we have here. 
Um, all right, and let's see what we've got here. So, Brett, this is more um, back to what you talked about at the beginning. This question is from Amy. She says, how, how do you select the right client? You know, you really want to get that vibe, and, and that's one of the main reasons why you need to be in contact with them. You know, for me, the perfect client is somebody who kind of has the same philosophy. When I tell them about all of these items in coordinating, I'll notice that they'll kind of agree. You know, they don't want to have to get ready to take pictures twice. You know what I mean? They'd rather, I'll, in a nutshell, I'll tell them, you know what, this should be fun. And show up, get married, kiss, be husband and wife, walk down the aisle, and go back, take pictures for 15 minutes, then drink champagne, drive to the reception, and have fun. And you know, and when you tell them, you know, they really did. honestly when I, when I saw my wife for the first time at the end of the aisle, that was that was a good enough moment. I, I I think that, you know, if you if you keep it simple, you really find that you don't need to do a whole separate set of photographic moments. But th that's all about the client. And from time to time you'll notice that it's better off if you do that with them and you'll know why when they sit down and speak with you um, but that's how I select my clients if they if you know if they have the time to speak with me and explain to me what's important to them and why and they have time to hear you know what's important to me and why then we click then I know that okay this client really is going to allow me and has we share the same vision so I'm gonna create a portfolio piece for myself as well as for this client. So I'm going to have a copy of their wedding book on my table and and that's a win-win. You get paid to do what you love, which is photograph their wedding. That's exactly right. All right, well I hope that helps out um you with that question and moving on here, we have tons of questions, so I'm going to do my best just to work my way down in the order they came in. So um That's great. Man. Yeah, this is awesome. So we have another question um this is a good one from uh, Cecil Hudgens. Um, I'm pretty satisfied with the photos I take in landscape orientation, but seldom happy with the photos I take in portrait orientation. The perspective or angle seems to be off. Any ideas on how to make it better? And I'd love to hear your answer on this because you have such creative perspectives on your photos, especially in portrait uh, orientation. You know, I think number one is I have a, the vertical grip. so. And and two would be, you know, you need to have your lens in the proper um, focal length. You know, if you're too wide and you're too close, then you're going to be distorted. Um, and it's about your perspective. Now, so I, I do. I shoot probably three quarters. I have to force myself to go into <laughs> landscape mode or horizontal, if you will. But I, I think two things to watch out for would be number one, if you have access, try to use the vertical shutter button on the vertical grip so you're not pulling the camera when you shoot because that, that's what probably half of the problem he's experiencing is you know he's you he's not getting a vertically correct um, axis on his photos and then there may be distortion so uh, it's it's all about you know how do you see if you know I see life vertical and I see architecture vertical palm trees are vertical so that's why I'm in vertical mode most of the time. All right. Well, I was going to say I was curious to hear your perspective on that since I, I've seen you take some interesting angles. And not you're definitely not afraid to get low for a photo. And <laughs> so I think that's also great advice, too. Don't be afraid to do that. Um, this is um, another question here that came in from Lisa. So Lisa says, um, I'm doing my first wedding on Saturday, and I'm a little nervous. Thank you for telling me not to be afraid to be in the center. That helps a lot. I'm curious what settings or ISO and setup you usually like to use while shooting the ceremonies indoor or uh, late afternoon. And um, I think this is what she's describing one time. So shooting the ceremonies indoor, uh, 4 p.m. mid-December with fluorescent lights, fluorescent overhead lights. Is it Amy? It's uh, Lisa. 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 Woohoo! Awesome, Lisa. Um, good question. 
first of all, if you shoot raw, you don't need to worry about the color temperature um, of the of the lights. So you can shoot raw, put the camera in neutral um, and Adobe RGB color space. Then, absolutely, if you want your work to stand out and be different than everybody else, um, be in the center and crank the ISO. Don't be afraid. Uh, crank it as high as it goes. <laughs> you know, if if you need to, I think one of the key things is when you're shooting stuff from the aisle, being people moving in and out for the processional and recessional. You want to make sure that you're at a fast enough shutter speed. So you're you're going to want to be wide open at 2.8. And really, this is important for everybody. Don't shoot really moving objects in a lot of ambient light with anything greater than 2.8 aperture. That's plenty of aperture 2.8. So you know I, I exceed 5,000 ISO quite often, 6,400, and with the Mark III, uh, I, I'm not afraid to turn it all the way up. To, I'll be at 128,000. <laughs> Whatever it takes to, to make sure you've got a good exposure. Don't underexpose when you're in high ISO because then you, you know, the images will start to take on more noise. So that's a great question, and uh, I hope I answered it well. Let me know. Lisa. All right. Yeah, absolutely. Um, this question comes in. How many photos do you take on an average wedding? You know, that's another thing about keeping it simple. Mm -hmm. it really, if you don't have an, a second shooter and you want to get through quickly, I mean, and the client has the same eye that you have, then basically it's all about your eye, isn't it? So it's going to be the amount of images that you shot. I, I shoot... I'll come home with about 2,000 to 3,000, um, sometimes for a, a, a smaller wedding. I'm usually at around 2,000 images for post-production in RAW. All right, that's a, that's a good number of photos right there. This question comes in. Um, let's see. Just jump And you up. don't want to give your clients more than really, I think, 800 images. I mean... After a group roundtable discussion with some of my great friends uh, at WPPI, we all decided that if you're giving a client more than 800 images, you're you're making it harder for them. Yeah, I'll definitely agree with that. That's just almost overwhelming. Um, yeah, so this is a good question from Denise. When a potential client calls for pricing, do you send them over your pricing documents? Um, email them, you know, or phone them. You know, really, how do you handle that that question? Especially because so many people um, throw out, you know, how much do you charge? So, just curious how you handle that. Well, the first thing you want to do is b by having a conversation with them in one way or another. And usually, if it's visual, it's best. So, and to save yourself time and your client time, you know, especially if you don't have a studio, um, do it visually with with you know FaceTime or Skype and switch switch the topic right away from how much does it cost to how good do we want it to be because there's no such thing as you know cheap photography is not good and good photography is not cheap we all know this as professionals working with top line equipment and Equi and you know post production equipment is expensive as well, so I, I would immediately kind of change the topic to you know what exactly are they looking for and how do they want it to happen you know how good do you want it to be and basically you 're going to give them your prices at some point that's that 's a no brainer but it 's how much by letting them know how much you care, how passionate you are how much it means to you, they're sharing with you how much it means to them as well, and then both of you come to the agreement that, wow, this is pretty important and we don't want it to go to the cheapest bidder, and really, nobody works for minimum wage that that creates art. You know, you want to, they want to hire an artist, and they just want to make sure they can afford you. All right. Uh I have another question here, Brett, from Tammy. 
Um, Tammy's question says, uh, I tend to get couples that focus on having event weddings, and I have the and I have a problem with lighting. I have to use my Speedlight 600 EX, but I have some ver but I get some very harsh shadows. How do you deal with really low lit reception areas? Well, let's ask her how she's. What orientation is are she, are you shooting straight on direct flash? Ask her that. All right, Tammy. You probably heard Brett repeat that. So, uh, how are how are you taking these photos where you're where you're getting these very harsh shadows? Um, all right. She Tammy says I try not to put right on put the flash directly on them, but sometimes it's difficult to get the shot. So I guess Brett, you you're really good at handling low lit situations. I guess let's focus on that perspective. Yeah, I find it to be really simple with the I would get the Gary Fong Lumisphere. I like the frosted with the flat top and it fits right on your speed light and I turn it vertical and I leave it vertical. So all you have to do is turn it, you know, if you if you go vertical, you turn it vertical and if you go horizontal, you flip it. So you you'll turn it in like a a four, you know, in a horizontal axis and and just basically you want to bring up your ISO I find that a great ISO to work with in a in a dark reception hall with with ambient light would be around 1200 to 1600 ISO when you're balancing with some fill flash I mean let's face it sometimes you need to you need to use that to most importantly you're just you need to capture the moments and uh, if you're shooting direct flash it's really it's not desirable. So when you use that the Fong sphere, you know, slow your shutter speed down to about a 60th or so. I even go slower than that. Sometimes I'm around a 15th or an eighth of a second, depends on the effect you want. And um, I'll be wide open at 2.8 much of the time to f5.6. And that should give you some great simple um, warm, warm looking photographs that are balanced. And you want to set the flash to manual. You know, don't use TTL because your exposure will kind of vary based on how close you are to the subject. All right. Well, hopefully that answers your question there, Tammy. I think that's a great response, yeah. Brett. Um, I do have a lot of questions from everyone about pricing and kind of breaking in either wedding photography in their area or where a meeting would be. And um, just because that's going to be so situational, guys, I would really recommend, you know, that link we have on the screen. If you want to check out Brett's um, documents that he has on there, his special, it basically has the pricing, his pricing in there, the wedding contract and the album design work agreement form. So if you're just getting into weddings and tuning in today, this is that's a great package you can check out because it's got really nails all three of those topics in there. So um, we're not going to try and answer any kind of questions with numbers on pricing only because um, it's going to be hard even for Brett or really anyone in here I think to throw out a median price range or where do you think a good starting price range is. Um, about someone who said should they price themselves lower to get in the market, I'm sure you have an opinion on that question though Brett. Yeah, if you're getting into the market, I mean, you might even want to have a, a, you know, a Facebook giveaway, you know, um, whatever it takes for you to get a wedding under your belt. And I think that hopefully this this webinar has given you all that you need to be armed with to go forward in that way. And um, you know, often if you're giving it away, it might seem worthless. So you might want to put some kind of a, you know, a special offer on it and and that's quite common you know in order to get into the market you you've got to have content so somebody's not going to hire somebody if they don't have a portfolio but um, you know you could try something like Craigslist or, or something like that maybe all right great all right so um, we have a lot of questions Brett about um, the high ISO that you've been referring to. A lot of people, I think, are really worried about cranking it up. Um, people are, uh, it seems a few people, you know, not everyone's jumped onto the 5D Mark III yet, so they're, you know, there's a lot of people still using 70s or Mark 5D Mark IIs and wondering, you know, would you raise your ISO above 1600 or above? Listen, the the 5D Mark II, I still have four of them. They're, they're great. Um, and I shoot in excess of 5,000 
all the time. Um, it's just a matter of don't underexpose it. And, uh, you know, you've got, in post-production, you've got plenty of uh, tools to remove any noise that you find is unacceptable, but uh, I, I find it to be, quite frankly, I, I even like noise in some of my images. It gives it, you know, depending on on what the, the subject matter is, it gives it a nice effect. But I find that I can shoot at 4,000 ISO, um, don't underexpose it, and 5,000 ISO, and still have a very um, very manageable file with you know with Lightroom. Lightroom 3.6 or 4.2 removes all noise, and I don't find it, you know color noise to be a problem at all. Yeah, absolutely. And um, if you guys are, I think a lot of people do get worried about it, and um, it depends on the photo too. I've seen some of your work, a lot of your black and white stuff too, and it it, it adds a really nice touch to it. It just depends on how you're using it. So maybe people... it depends on the client and how they, you know. I think that my clients are drawn to the old-fashioned kind of grainy film look, so uh, I use that in those situations. Um, I find it desirable. All right, awesome. Well, what we're going to do here, um, I think we have pretty much hit almost all the questions here. Um, everyone, thank you guys for tuning in. I'm just going to go give a once over here and see if we have any more. All right. Um, a couple quick, one more quick question, Brett. Um, let's see. This is from Sarah, uh, and Sarah, I'm sure Brett will give you a more detailed answer on this. So, Sarah said, um, "You said you don't use a flash during your weddings, or not that often. Do you set up any other lighting around the church or the hall?" I don't set up any other lighting during the ceremony at all. I, I occasionally if it's a really, really dark and it's late at late in the evening and there's no light coming in basically at all and I'm gonna have a really flat looking, you know, poorly lit I, I don't find myself in those situations because usually they've you know, they're in a very high high end church which is lit very well. But, you know, from time to time you're in a situation where you need to and then I just use the on-camera uh, flash and I'll put the lumosphere on it and I'll get beautifully lit right on the money each time photographs with the lumosphere and the on-camera flash and uh, it also helps your focus because it's your, your, your speed light will focus and lock focus faster which is can be an issue when you're in a very dark church with people moving. Um, at, in the hall um, yes, I do. I use uh, my Sony video lights. I put them on stands if I need to to get a nice um, backlit, say on a on a on a table shot, or if I take a couple out um, in an, in a nice room and I want to balance the candlelight, you know. So I'll put a I'll have an assistant hold uh, one of the video lights to the side on the front, so I'll give them three-quarter frontal lighting, and then I'll, I'll even backlight them with another light, so that gives them some hair light and some backlighting, and it makes a really dramatic, really nice image. Um, from time to time, I, I do use um, a couple speed lights up on stands. Just depends on, you know, how much time do we have to get set up, and, but quite frankly, um, I, I find that that's kind of in the past, you know, with being able to use high ISO, um, I, I kind of want to keep the, the the warm tones of the room where I find that, you know, speed lights, unless you use filters with them, there's just something more to worry about. It's It doesn't go with the keep it simple philosophy and somebody's walking around tripping on them or having to put those lights up, you know, next to the band and things like that. It's just one more thing that you don't need to worry about really. So try to move away from it, I think. All right. Well, Brett, um, I wanted to thank you for your time today, putting together a great presentation. It looks like we are going to go ahead and 
um, wrap everything up here. I wanted to thank everybody who's attended today for you know all of the great questions and making today just absolute blast. So we're going to go ahead and wrap everything up. And Brett, just one more time, thanks again. We really appreciate you putting together the presentation for us. My pleasure, Danny. Thanks for having me. All right, everybody. Well, thank you again for joining us. We'll uh, have a new episode of Photo Biz Live next week. You guys can check out the up-and-coming episode on our blog. And I hope everybody has.